Welcome, everybody. My name is Ray Andrewson. I'm the executive director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. We're the affiliate chamber of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. We want to welcome you today to our webinar presentation for human resources. We want to thank our three panelists who we'll be introducing in just a moment. And uh, those folks will be uh, taking it away from here to give you a presentation, a lot of details and updates for the 2023 changes uh, in HR. We want to thank you all for being with us here uh, today. And uh, we also uh, would like to let you know that we're going to be telling you a little bit about some of our events uh, that we have here at the chamber uh, coming up in just a spell as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring in our uh, panelists and, and uh, also tell you a little bit uh, about uh, what they're going to be doing uh, here today. I'd like to uh, bring first up uh, today, Sarah Healy. She is the partner with our HR sponsor, Carmody, Torrance, Sandek, and Hennessy LLP. Uh, Sarah, welcome. It's good to have you here today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you here as well. Also, Paul Corellis. Paul is the vice president of HR and client services for MPHR. Paul, thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Ray. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. And also Robert McDermott. Uh, Rob is with Senior Partner and Account Manager of Human Interest and with Human Interest. Thanks for being with us here today. And my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. And we thank you also, Carmody, Torrance, Sendek, and Hennessy LLP. They are the sponsors of our HR Council. And I'd like to turn over uh, right now the presentation to uh, Sarah. Sarah is going to be leading us for the next 30 minutes. Uh, we'll have a presentation with each of our panelists. And uh, you'll have an opportunity in the chat and the Q&A at about 1235 or so, or 1230 later on, uh, to ask your specific questions. So uh, we also have Sarah here, who's got the screen sharing capabilities, will be uh, leading us through a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Sarah, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very warm welcome. Um, as Ray noted, we are going to cover uh, updates to state and federal laws that impact the workplace. I'm going to start today by covering um, some updates to Connecticut law, and then I'm going to turn it over to Robert, who will take us through some benefit-specific issues, and Paul will close us out with developments at the federal level, um, which has seen much more activity this year. The 2023 Connecticut legislative session was quieter than it has been in past years. Still, employers should be aware of several bills that did pass and some that did not pass, but are likely to return in future sessions. Let's see, okay, so I'm gonna begin by talking about um, some workers' compensation issues. So currently, eligibility for workers' compensation benefits for post-traumatic stress injuries, or what we can refer to as PTSI, is limited to first responders such as police officers, firefighters, emergency medical service personnel, and emergency 911 dispatchers who are diagnosed with PTSI as a direct result of certain qualifying events that occur in the line of duty. Beginning in January of 2024, this law will be expanded to allow all employees, not just first responders, um, all employees who are covered by the workers' compensation law to be eligible to receive benefits for post-traumatic stress injuries if the same qualifying events occur in their line of duty. So what are the qualifying events? Well, these include when an employee views a deceased minor, witnesses a person's death or an incident involving a person's death, witnesses an injury to a person who then dies before or upon admission to a hospital as a result of the injury, um, and when an employee witnesses a traumatic physical injury that results in the loss of a vital body part or function that permanently disfigures that victim, or when an employee carries or has physical contact with and treats an injured person who then dies before or upon admission to a hospital as a result of that injury. So just some examples that I could think of as when this may come into play would be maybe, for example, if you have a construction worker on a construction site um, and unfortunately, a coworker falls from a building and suffers a serious injury um, or death. That could possibly be a situation where a coworker might be able to utilize um, workers' compensation benefits for a post traumatic stress injury diagnosis. Um, 
As with the eligibility in existing law for first responders, however, the qualifying event must be a substantial factor in causing the injury. And the injury must not have resulted from a disciplinary action, work evaluation, job transfer, layoff, demotion, promotion, um, termination, retirement, or similar type of employment action. So in other words, for example, an employee who receives a written warning or is laid off for lack of work would not be able to bring a workers' comp claim for PTSI that was allegedly caused by that written warning or layoff. So there are some protections there that it doesn't expand into that type of situation. Um, our next issue that received some attention this past legislative session was whether striking workers should be afforded certain benefits. And what did end up passing um, states that would, beginning in October 1st of 2023, so very soon, employees who, whose health insurance coverage is terminated by an employer because of a labor dispute will be able to take advantage of a special enrollment period through Connecticut's health insurance exchange. This, in other words, will enable employees to receive health insurance through Connecticut's health insurance exchange while they are on strike. Um, there were some expansions to Connecticut's paid sick leave. And before I address what those are, it probably helps review some of the basic tenets of the current law. Many of you may recall that this law has been in existence since 2012 generally applies to employers with 50 or more Connecticut employees and excludes most manufacturers. It limits covered employees to um, service workers, which is subject to very specific definitions in the law that we won't get into today. Um, covered employees earn one hour of paid sick leave for every 40 hours worked up to a maximum of 40 hours per year. And currently, the paid sick leave may be used for the employee's illness or preventative medical care or to care for their spouse or child for the same reason. And it may also be used by an employee um, for certain reasons when that employee is a victim of family violence or sexual assault. Now, beginning in October 1st of this year, covered employees may use the sick leave if they are a parent or guardian of a child who is a victim of family violence or sexual assault and needs time off for medical care or counseling, obtaining services from a victim services organization, relocating due to the family violence or sexual assault, or participating in any civil or criminal proceedings related to family violence or sexual assault. So it essentially extends the same type of leave that the employee would have for their own being a victim of, of family violence or sexual assault themselves if they are a parent or guardian of a child who has had a similar um, circumstance. Additionally, paid sick leave will now allow covered employees um, to use sick leave for a mental health wellness day, which includes a day during which the employee attends to their emotional and psychological well-being. One question comes to mind that isn't quite clear. Um, as far as what does it mean to attend to emotional or psychological well-being? Could that include any activity the employee deems helpful to their emotional well-being, or is it something more limited? So we continue to look to see if um, the Department of Labor issues any guidance on this, um, and we'll continue to keep our eyes on that, as should you, to see if there is any restriction on when that might be used. But for now, you should know that if you are covered by this law, employees um, who are eligible to use it may use it to attend to your emotional or psychological well-being as well as preventative medical care and the other reasons we discussed. Um, our next slide um, has to do with non-competes. Um, non-competes have received a lot of attention um, in our state and, and across the nation. Um, we have in existence since 2016, a law that restricts the use of non-compete agreements for physicians. Um, existing law provides among other things that a non-compete covenant for a physician cannot exceed one year and cannot cover a geographic area that is more than 15 miles from the primary site where that physician works. Um, there were some amendments to this law um, the session, and as of July 1st, 2023, so already in existence, the definition of primary site has been narrowed. 
It means any single office, facility, or location where the physician practices um, and that the parties agree as that primary site and is defined in the agreement. The new law also provides that for group practices with 35 or more employees, non-compete agreements that have been entered into amended, extended, or renewed on or after October 1st of this year will not be enforceable if the physician doesn't agree to a proposed material change to the compensation terms of the agreement um, and the contract expires or the employment or contractual relationship is terminated by the employer unless that relationship is terminated by the employer for cause. Finally, um, this is important, beginning on October 1st, 2023, the restrictions on non-compete agreements that are applicable to physicians now will also extend to advanced practice registered nurses and physician assistants. I wanna just touch on some um, proposed bills that did not pass this past legislative session, but we wouldn't be surprised if they actually return again. Um, as I noted earlier, there's been a lot of talk about restricting the use of non-compete agreements, and this keeps coming up um, again and again, um, and it did as well this past session. So I would um, predict that non-compete agreements will remain the target of significant proposed legislation. Um, there were also uh, proposed expansions of paid sick leave that would have expanded it to cover all private employers and broadened the circumstances in which employees could use that sick leave and increase the rate of accrual um, and amount of sick leave that employees could accrue and use throughout the year. Um, there was a bill that would have eliminated the sub minimum wage, so that would just be one minimum wage that did not pass, but could come up again. Um, there were some proposals concerning paid family and medical leave. Um, that would have prohibited disability benefits from being reduced based on paid FMLI benefits um, that the employee receives through the authority. And finally, there were also some proposals that um, striking workers could receive unemployment benefits and that did not pass this year, but could return um, in the future. And so that kind of highlights what happened in the legislative um, session. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Robert who will take us through some of the uh, benefits issues. Let's see, I'm getting to that slide, Robert, for you. There you go. All right. Cool. Sarah, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, getting on, on the topic of benefit, um, uh, um, we focus on, we're focusing on <clears throat> the Connecticut State uh, Retirement Mandate uh, that was passed year, a few years ago. Um, and is requiring employers in Connecticut to offer their employees um, a retirement plan. Um, and I like to start here because this shows that Connecticut employers are not alone. Um, so as you can see, uh, across the country, mandates are uh, popping up, um, are in full swing, or are in legislative process. Um, so, you know, no matter where you <laughs> employ people, at some point across the country, there's going to be a mandate to to follow. Um, so uh, one of the one of the things folks may not know <clears throat> is even if you are in a state without an active mandate, your clients or you can be impacted. So for example, if you're a Connecticut employer with uh, any California employees, um, California has a mandate where anybody with one or more employee uh, needs to have a retirement plan in place. So you are impacted uh, in Connecticut, uh, regardless if you have that employee in, in California. Um, next slide, Sarah. So my CT savings uh, is the uh, program uh, that uh, put forth the retirement mandate. Um, is who's who's impacted? So any employer with five or more employees <clears throat> who don't offer a retirement plan today, um, what makes them eligible? So anybody that has five or more employees, um, and the employees need to make over five thousand dollars a year to. Uh, make them an equivalent um, to uh, uh, to to you having to put forth a retirement plan. So $5,000 a year is not exactly um, a ton of money. So anybody making $100 a week is, is going to put you in that bucket of uh, having to uh, offer a retirement plan. So what is it? The, uh, the CT savings plan is an auto enrolled Roth IRA. It uh, does um, include you have to uh, provide a 3% match. Um, and when? So the deadline for this uh, is coming up uh, next week, actually. 
Um, so all businesses need to do something uh, before next Thursday uh, to register uh, with the state or uh, put forth a, a qualified plan and attest that they have a plan in place for their employees. Uh, as you can see, there were deadlines for larger employers, but uh, the focus now is on the five or more employee businesses. Next slide, Sarah. Uh, so what's the responsibility for you as the uh, as the business owner? Um, <clears throat> as you can see, it's a very uh, heavily uh, manual administrative process. So you're responsible for all changes, um, providing the state with new hires, with uh, bank account information, uh, you know, sending contributions, uh, adding or moving employees to a census. Uh, so if someone leaves, where does that money go? Um, if they want to opt out, uh, it's a manual process. So, um, unfortunately, the the you know the the state's plan is um, is heavily burdensome on the employer. Um, whereas there are other plans uh, out there that you know provide some administrative help as far as automating deductions and and banking um, and getting things uh, filed like fifty five hundreds on an automated basis. Next slide. What are the penalties? Uh, so right now, technically, there aren't any. Um, but as you can see, there is a bill on the table right now uh, that passed the House and it's in the Senate, uh, where uh, fines could range between $500 and $1,500, uh, depending on the size of the company. Um, you know, that could change. Uh, do I think that that's pretty close to what they're, they're going to be? Um, I do. Uh, and they can very easily find out if you do or do not have a plan in place by just pulling payroll data, right? So they can they could check W twos and <clears throat> a Department of Labor can can take a look and see if there's a, a you know the box filled out for a qualified retirement plan. Um, so kind of stay tuned on this, but uh, there are uh, penalties on the table that will be uh, brought to light. Uh, I'm sure shortly after the deadline uh, next week. Next slide. Um, so this is probably a little bit outdated considering we're, we're pretty tight to the deadline, but um, you know, use this these this time to do your research, right? So um, take a look at what the state offers, take a look at alternatives out there. Um, there are other low cost uh, options that can be uh, maybe more beneficial. Um, the deadlines can uh, can change at any time. So uh, the deadline that was, was is coming uh, coming up next week was actually March 31st, and they pushed it back to give folks more of an opportunity to um, to go out there and do their research. Uh, and look at it as, as an additional benefit, right? So you look at it as offering your employees an opportunity to save. Um, you can recruit you know, uh, more quality talent when you offer a 401k or, or some kind of retirement. Um, as well as it helps is retaining those employees and staying with your company versus, um, you know, moving somewhere else where they have these types of benefits. So, Sarah, thank you. And uh, uh, pass it over to Paul. Great. Thank you so much. Um, have, good afternoon, everybody. Looking forward to doing some quick hits on, on what the federal government has has been up to. Um, and before I dig into the Supreme Court and uh, other federal agencies, one item I forgot to put on the slides but did want to quickly mention is that there is now a new I-9 form. Um, USCIS just recently, uh, this month or last, issued a new I-9 form to be used when you hire a new employee to prove their identity and their authorization to work in the United States. So. There isn't different information required as part of the new I-9 process, um, but there are some changes to the form. Most notably, they took section one and, and two, which used to be on separate pages and condensed them all into one single-sided page. So it's it has a more condensed look to it. Um, there is also now a separate page for rehires and re-verifications, as well as a separate page for um, certification of a translator if a translator is being used to assist the employee with filling out the form. So as of right now, you are still able to use the previous version of the form. Um, that one has is expired, has been expired for quite some time, but is still permissible. You just wanna make sure you start using the new form no later than November 1st. So um, just be mindful of that. 
All right, so we can kick things off into the next slide. Um, Supreme Court was, was busy as their session came to a close earlier this summer. Um, certainly a lot of attention, headline grabbing uh, decisions that they made, uh, but there were also many that didn't quite capture the same level of media attention. Um, and many that did affect employment law, some directly, some indirectly. So let's talk about a few of those. First of which has to do with, with religious accommodation. So this was, this was a pretty big one in, in terms of uh, HR and employment. So that case is Groff versus DeJoy. So this had to do with a United States Postal Service worker, um, a delivery person. So um, this person was a practicing Christian, uh, had requested to not work on Sundays, which when we think back historically, that wasn't such a big deal. There isn't typically mail delivery on Sundays through the USPS, but as e-commerce became more popular and as there was more of a demand for delivery seven days a week, um, the Postal Service did eventually contract with Amazon and some others to provide package deliveries on Sundays. So they then had a need for having letter carriers and delivery people available to work um, on Sundays. Uh, Mr. Groff requested that time off as a religious accommodation. At first, they were able to honor that, but as things got busier and staffing got tighter, um, they no longer could uh, accommodate that accommodation. So things soured and eventually things went through the courts and up to the Supreme Court. And how the Supreme Court decided on this was that um, in favor of the employee and pretty much set a standard of a, a really high bar that for a business to deny a religious accommodation for a sincerely held religious belief, um, the business really has the onus to, to prove a, a true undue hardship on the business if, they're, if they were to grant the religious accommodation. So they'd have to show that this was going to have a, a large impact on the business um, if they were to, to honor it. So um, if you do deal with religious accommodation requests in the workplace, just know that um, the bar is pretty high for you to be able to, to deny those. The next case has to do with union unionization and unionization efforts. So this is Glacier Northwest versus the Teamsters Union. Um, what happened here was um, Glacier Northwest was a company, um, like a construction type company, dealing with concrete and cement and things like that. And their claim was that the employees knew that they were going to be going on strike that day, but still reported to work turned on the machines, got the cement mixing, what have you, and then walked off the job with all of that stuff still in motion, um, require, uh, which resulted in damages to their supplies, damages to their equipment, and some rather large costs. <clears throat> so the, the question in front of the Supreme Court, there are a few, but um, the one that we'll talk about today was whether or not the company would have a tort claim um, to claim damages that resulted from this effort when there was they felt negligence, um, and kind of violations or, or whether that was kind of protected unionization activity. In this case, the court said that uh, the company could have a valid court uh, tort claim and that, um, that going on strike do doesn't necessarily protect you know, a union or employees from, from doing damage to a business. The next is affirmative action. So this is one you most likely did hear about in the headlines. And so this is more of an indirect. So this case had to do with college admissions, obviously. Um, and here we're talking about HR and employment. Uh, I just bring this one up because the, there is obviously the chance to apply that same standard to a business's affirmative action policy. So if you do have one or something similar, you probably want to consult with, with legal counsel just to make sure that um, and understand what, what risk of any there might be in continuing an affirmative action plan in employment. And then finally, um, this is of note to anyone who pays employees a, a daily rate. So there was a case involving Helix Energy Solutions where they had an employee, a highly compensated employee, and I, I believe uh, this company does work in the oil industry and on oil rigs. So this employee was paid a daily rate, uh, on a large daily rate, uh, made, made six figures working out on the oil rigs, but sometimes working long hours and, and well over 40 hours in the work week. So because he was highly compensated and, and paid a flat daily rate, and had some exempt job duties, they treated this employee as exempt. 
well, he felt that, you know, based on this daily rate, that that wasn't a salary, it was a daily rate, so that despite the level of his compensation, um, that he should be considered non-exempt and should be eligible for, for overtime payments for the hours that he worked in excess of 40. And the, the court did, did side with the employee. So um, if you are paying someone a daily rate and treating that the same as a standard weekly salary, you're going to want to rethink that and either reconsider the classification of that employee or um, change their pay structure to be a, a consistent weekly salary amount. Uh, and then finally on this one, there was um, a case involving um, gender dysmorphia and whether or not that should have protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The court declined to hear that case this session, so uh, we'll see if they pick it up next time around. We can go to the next slide. All right, so the National Labor Relations Board has been, been very busy um, and continues to be so over the summer months. So uh, the National Labor Relations Board is a, a kind of funny topic because as the administration um, in the White House changes parties, they then get a majority of the seats on the National Labor Relations Board. So as we've seen it switch from Democratic control to Republican control over the last decade or so, um, similarly, we've seen the rulings kind of go back and forth and back and forth in terms of how employers need to stay in compliance with the National Labor Relations Act. So we're starting now over the last several months, especially starting to see that tide change and um, the board hearing cases very similar to ones that the board under the Trump administration had heard um, and doing a complete 180. So the most recent one has to do with with handbook policies. Um, so uh, the case before them last month had to do with um, the company Stericycle, but basically they have set a new standard for how workplace rules and handbook policies are to be interpreted and in that if a policy is overly broad and could be construed to being chilling to an employee's rights to collective bargaining, unionization, or other protected concerted speech, um, that it's going to be assumed to be unlawful and that a business is going to be expected to more narrowly define those rules so that they're not in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. So you're really going to want to take a look, especially if your handbook hasn't um, was updated in the last handful of years. You're going to want to take a look at your handbook policies, make sure that there isn't anything in there that's overly broad um, that has to do with an employee's behavior or what they can say or not say in the workplace, confidentiality rules, um, solicitation rules, things like that, things that, that could be construed as chilling to their rights. Uh, you're going to want to take a look at those and potentially revise them. NLRB this summer also weighed in on severance agreements, saying that overly broad non-disparagement clauses in severance agreements, along with um, overly broad confidentiality clauses in severance agreements may be unlawful. So um, it's very commonplace for a release of claims to contain language having to do with um, non-disparagement or sometimes a mutual non-disparagement clause. Again, uh, if you haven't recently, you're going to want to have legal counsel review those to make sure that they are in line with the, the latest rulings from the NLRB. The general counsel of the NLRB this summer released a memo to the field offices kind of saying that in in their view that non-compete agreements as a whole are unlawful. So there hasn't been a specific case on this. They haven't haven't heard anything. As you may have heard, the Federal Trade Commission also weighed in with, with a similar viewpoint. There hasn't been anything enacted in terms of law nor case law that would speak to non-competes being banned at the federal level, but uh, it was curious to see that um, the current National Labor Relations Board, or at least their general counsel, views them as, as unlawful. They are have also weighed in on how to handle workplace outbursts. So the previous NLRB had said, when an employee acts inappropriately, you can kind of apply your general workplace standards to that behavior or that language and, um, and punish appropriately. In the new ruling, they kind of said you really have to take the context into account before you do any kind of disciplinary action. So if this was part of a strike or, you know, a claim for a unfair labor practice that there might be a higher bar in terms of what an employee is allowed to do or say or act out upon before it becomes a, a disciplinary action. 
And then finally from NLRB, um, there was a case involving independent contractors. So this had to do with the Atlanta Opera Company and their hair and makeup artists. So they had been treating these folks as independent contractors and util utilizing the previous NLRB's rules of entrepreneurial opportunity as the, the main factor there. So um, this NLRB said, no, you really, more so than entrepreneurial opportunity, need to factor in the amount of control that, that the business has over the workers in terms of how the work is done, when it's done, where it's done, what have you. And that in this case, these hair and makeup artists should be considered employees and have collective bargaining and other employee rights as other employees of the opera house do. So again, uh, a more, a different lens to view your independent contractors through um, at several agencies and NLRB is just one of those. And then they are also working on a rule for joint employers. So that'll be when an employer uh, is or when multiple employers are deemed to, to be joint and, and sharing in responsibility and liability um, for those workers happens a lot say with temp agencies that the temp agency and the place that they're sending them due to do the work is is a joint employer but that can be a lot different and a lot muddier and, and more difficult to determine in other situations franchisor and franchisee situations things like that so um, they will be coming out with a a more constructed rule on that in the coming months. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the Department of Labor uh, is an agency that we're really waiting on a lot of big news from. Uh, in terms of, of what the delay is, their, their secretary, well, their previous secretary, Marty Walsh, um, left a handful of months ago. The second in command was formally nominated to be the new Secretary of Labor. That nomination is hung up a little bit in the legislature, so they have not yet been formally confirmed. So that might be part of the delay, but uh, she is the acting secretary at the moment. But there are a number of things that they promised us earlier in the spring, and a lot of that did get pushed and was now promised to us in August. Um, but we're here. August 23rd, nearing the end of the month, and these items still have not yet been published in the Federal Register. So the most notable uh, is a proposed rule altering the Fair Labor Standards Act and its treatment of, of overtime. So this is something that they've been promoting for, I think, more than a year now, and again, has been delayed and delayed. Uh, most recently, they did say the proposed rule would be published this month. Um, what that will include, we don't know for sure. It'll almost certainly be an increase in the minimum salary amount for an employee to be exempt from overtime. It could also have an element of in automatic indexing where that salary threshold is automatically indexed every year or every handful of years based on the consumer price index or some other measure. There also might be changes to the duties test. Uh, they may adopt something similar to California, where they say at least 50% of an employee's time needs to be doing and performing exempt job duties. We don't know. There could also be changes to the specific exemptions and what those might include. You know, the, the computer workers exemption is one that comes to mind as, as one that could probably use some updating just because of changes in technology, but we'll see and hopefully soon on that. They're also going to be... Um, issuing a new proposed rule on fiduciary responsibilities um, when it comes to retirement and other similar plans. They're also promising a proposed rule on their interpretation of who qualifies as an independent contractor from the federal level and who needs to be treated as a W-2 employee. OSHA, uh, which is uh, an agency within the Department of Labor, um, has some stuff that, that they're working on right now. One of which is workplace violence and healthcare. So creating some standards there. Um, it's something that they've seen a large spike in in terms of vi workplace violence incidents, specifically in the healthcare industry. So they're looking to address that. Um, they're also hard at work uh, creating some standards for heat illness, for especially for outdoor workers. Um, that's become a big problem this summer, especially, and, and continues to be, be one. So they are working on issuing some standards there. And then they did just... Um, release the final rules requiring many more businesses and smaller businesses where the standard before was 250 or more employees and now 100 or more employees that many more industries that they consider to be 
at higher risk starting next year will have to electronically submit their 300, 300A, and 301 forms that basically summarize any safety incidents that happened in the workplace in the previous year. So um, something you can reach out, us, out to us about or another trusted HR professional to make sure you're in compliance there. And then again, based on your industry, you may or may not have to be in compliance with that. And then finally, um, on the DOL front, they recently submitted some data dating back to October and, and over that 10 month period um, really spoke to the spike in investigations and in charges relating to child labor violations um, up over 44% from the previous period, um, over 4,000 child labor violations that, that they discovered. So at the start of this year, they did declare that they were gonna be taking um, a really hard approach and be devoting a lot of resources to auditing and reviewing child labor and making sure that there weren't violations, especially in hospitality, retail, and other industries that tend to employ a lot of uh, minors in the work workforce. And they have lived up to that. I've certainly seen it in, in our consulting work and in the clients we work with that there have been a, a number of DOL audits really centered around child labor practices, pay, wage, and hour, um, job duties, things like that. So they've they've lived up to their promise there. Um, so if you do employ folks under the age of 18, you do want to make sure that you're doing a self audit, reviewing your wage and hour practices, reviewing the job duties of those minors and make sure your managers and supervisors are following both the federal and state level child labor laws for, for where those folks are employed. And then finally, um, over at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, they've been tasked with setting some guidelines for the recently passed Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, and they released their proposed rule last week. It's a whopping 275-page document, so we are still wrapping our heads around that, and again, it is a proposed rule. The final version of the rule will be coming um, by the end of the year, but some, some key things that we did take away from that, uh, really the the main purpose of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was to kind of close a loophole where pregnancy on its own wasn't considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So when a, a pregnant worker re requested or required accommodations, the ADA wasn't really there for them. So the federal government uh, late last year passed the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, and now the EOC is really kind of shaping up those guidelines. and. One of the most notable ones and one that's really a departure from the ADA is that it's, it sets the stage where uh, a business may be expected to accommodate a pregnant worker um, even if those accommodations don't allow the employee to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. So if you're familiar with the ADA, essentially the accommodations that you're providing under ADA are so that the employee can perform the essential functions of their job. Um, so this sets the stage that barring an undue hardship, you may need to create accommodations for employee, an employee that include giving them uh, you know, up to six months of them not being able to perform one or more of the essential functions of their job. So again, something to keep a close eye on as the comment period that we're in now takes place and when the final rule is published. There is also some detail in that document about documentation requirements you know, several accommodation requests that you really shouldn't be requesting medical certification for, things like more frequent restroom breaks, having water um, with them if that's not something that you typically allow, things like that. Um, and also just talking about considerations and, and really taking a reasonable approach to pregnancy in the workplace and understanding that, you know, an employee may require accommodations before they've started seeing a medical professional for their pregnancy. They might be suffering from morning sickness, for instance, and, and need some accommodations around that, but haven't had their first doctor's appointment. Or the fact that there may be delays in, in seeing a doctor, and there may be time between appointments where it may be feasible and advisable for you to create a, an accommodation um, and put that in place even before they're able to consult and get formal documentation from, from their doctor. So more on that to come for sure in the coming months, but uh, just wanted to put that in front of everyone so they can start to prepare accordingly. And then finally, uh, for those of you who are subject to EEO-1 filings um, and the EEO-1 report, those are generally 
businesses with 100 or more employees or employers who are considered federal contractors um, usually are used to having this filed by now. Uh, they are doing a review and revamp of the EEO one site. So that filing deadline is delayed until the fall. Okay, I think that's that's it for me. Thank you so much. Well, we want to thank you, Paul. That was very, uh, very comprehensive as well to Robert and uh, Sarah. Thanks so much uh, for everything. This is uh, this is very, very informative. You see a big question mark here, folks. We're starting to see some questions uh, in the Q and A. So I'm going to keep that queue up for a little bit, Sarah. Uh, if we might, so we can uh, get some of your questions uh, directed. I think uh, early on, we got a question too for you, Sarah. Um, and, and this is, um, here's a question as we read it. For a mental health wellness day, this will be an additional uh, to our already existing PTO policy at our organization. So for example, if we already have a PTO policy that employees can use for sick leave, personal leave or vacation, would this be stacked onto our policy? Long question, Sarah. Ooh, sure. So I guess the, the first question I have, and um, I don't know the answer to this one, but would be whether or not paid sick leave applies to this employer. Um, and as I noted, um, the paid sick leave law has been in place since 2012. Um, and it applies to um, service worker employees. And so if you if that law already applies to you, then this expansion does. If 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 you've already determined that that law does not apply to your particular um, place of employment, then you don't need to consider it. But if it does apply to you, um, you just want to make sure that your PTO policy is in compliance with the law. So it's not necessarily stacked on top. Um, assuming that your policy is already in compliance with the law, you're allowing employees to accrue the one hour of paid sick leave um, for every 40 hours worked. Um, you are then must allow the employees to use that paid sick leave um, for a mental health wellness day. Um, this expansion is just really expanding the reasons that the employee can take advantage of the paid sick leave. Great, good question. And good answer. Got a lot, a lot of information on there too. So we are going to welcome uh, your questions. If you'd like to put them in the Q and A, uh, we're going to be firing the way. And, and it would be very helpful if you'd like to address one of our three panelists directly with your questions. So I think this applies to you, Paul, because this came yeah. in during your yep. presentation. Um, we are a small company, forty-five employees. Are we required to submit OSHA electronic submissions? So the answer to that is it depends. So. All of these OSHA rules, new and old, when it comes to um, what forms you're required to submit and how, and whether you're just required to display them in your workplace or actually electronically submit them to OSHA um, is really dependent on your industry. So if OSHA determines that your industry is quote unquote high hazard, then um, if you're over 20 employees, you'd be required to submit the, the 300A um, electronically to OSHA. So. Again, it, it is really industry specific in terms of whether and the amount of hazard that OSHA feels that uh, your industry presents on whether or not you, know, you need to file that electronic. Yeah, great. So we welcome all of your questions. If you can keep firing these questions away towards us, uh, we'll, we'll answer your specific questions. I have a generalist, sort of a, a layperson's question for all three of you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll actually go in reverse from Paul to Robert to Sarah with this question. Um, Many, many people will admit uh, we're not, we're lefty or righty, but we're kind of ambidextrous. Sure. Um, if you could say people aren't just 50 shades of gray, we're 51 shades of gray. Uh, we're kind of nuanced human beings. So when someone comes into you with a specific issue or some of the complexities of human life and how it relates to the workplace, how do you deal with these gray areas that may not seemingly fit neatly into a box of some of the laws? Paul, I'll talk to you, for, uh, get your answer first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it, it's difficult. You know, it, being an employer these days is certainly not easy. There, there are a lot of considerations you have to take, and and it isn't even as simple as just knowing what the laws and and the rules are. You have to also, you know, keep up with how they're being interpreted by the courts and how they're being interpreted by these agencies that that we just spoke about a few minutes ago. So, um, you certainly have to be strategic with your approach, and you also have to wear your PR hat too as as you make business decisions and and really focus on. 
once you do make a decision on something, how are you communicating that? Um, you know, are the things you're saying or, you know, things you're sending out, maybe more importantly, going to end up if they end up on social media or Glassdoor or things like that, you know, how are they going to paint you as an employer? Are you a, a compassionate employer? Are you a compliant employer? Are you um, someone who, who can be, be framed to look um, not empathetic and, and, and hard line? So does, there is certainly a lot of strategy involved and uh, more so now, more so than ever, while you you need to keep consistent with your HR policies and practices and not be discriminatory. Um, more and more now, I'd say you have to really look at things on a case by case basis because there isn't always a, a one one size fits all approach to these HR issues as they pop up. Yeah, yeah, but you had the guidelines. Robert, uh, how do you deal with this complexity, these gray areas? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I guess in 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 our world, it's it's not as it's kind of a little more black and white because they're set the employee number to uh, providing a retirement plan. But um, I think in general, uh, what I recommend to clients and and folks is lean on your your partners, right? So you know you have <clears throat> payroll people, advisors, HR folks. Uh, CPAs, you know, lean on those folks to help you get through these these gray area questions because there are folks like us providing the information through those channels where they can, you know, get more clarity on what they need to do uh, when there's those, you know, nuanced situations. Yeah, great answer. And finally, from a legal perspective, Sarah, I'm just going to print the image here. Uh, speed limit 65. Uh, that's the law. Uh, a lot of people consider that guideline. Uh, how do you deal with some of that uh, making the law firm and yet dealing with a little bit of softness around it? Yeah, so I, I think particularly when there is the gray area that you speak of, um, you know, I, I like to walk clients through the different options. I mean, first outline what the law is, right? What what are the outlines of the law that we need to be complying with? And then what are our, our options? Um, it helps to understand what the business need is, of course. And I, I think, you know, I always try to really dive into that. Like, what, what is your goal here? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you concerned about? And then we go through what are your options A, B, and C, and what are the risks of doing each? And then they kind of have to weigh um, the costs of each of those risks and the benefits of each of those risks and make a decision as to which one they're most comfortable with. And one thing though, that I always need to remind employers and those who are in HR really understand this that you have to make sure whatever decision you make, that's something you can apply uniformly and consistently to other employment situations. Because the last thing you wanna be doing is picking and choosing um, how you're gonna deal with one employee because maybe you really like that employee and that employee is super productive, but you're not gonna apply that same answer to an employee who isn't productive and isn't your favorite. So you really have to think those through too. Um, is how will this be applied long term if you had another situ similar situation coming up? Great. Consistency. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're getting a lot of questions right now. So let's go through these uh, first. I think um, Sarah, Paul, I think, I don't know about Robert, about this question. Um, at what point will the National Labor Relations Board manual be available for new guidance? Easy answer. Yes. So Stephanie, you can speak about this as well. I mean, in terms of the National Labor Relations Board, there, you know, they'll issue rulings and and have them on their website in terms of their their standards. But it's it's generally derived from them hearing a specific case and taking on that case and then using that as the guide to issue further guidance. So, you know, with this this handbooks one, for instance, and the, the workplace rules uh, on their site, they kind of said, here's what the old standard is, here's what the new standard is. And so, again, if you're just generally broad with with what we consider to be something that could potentially be chilling, um, then then your workplace rule is unlawful and, and you're gonna be expected to make it more narrowly defined. I think, you know, the best thing you can do, um, I'm always advising clients, let's not have you be the, the precedent center, precedent setter here on this. Um, definitely play it conservatively, definitely work with HR advisement and legal counsel and their interpretation, they're keeping on top of, you know, um, cases as they as they work their way through the board or through the courts um, and then can help you based on on those rulings and those decisions help you shame your shape your policies to be in, in line with that so i don't know who wants to feel this next question thank you paul um 
Uh, this is a step up. How do you deal with religious accommodation requests when several staff members want to take uh, Sundays off or a particular day off, saying it's for religious purposes? So instead of one, I guess numerous would like to take that day off. Jump in. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really tricky. And I don't know, you know, I, I think where this is, especially where this is such a new Supreme Court ruling, um, really determining where where is the line on on undue hardship on a business, you know where where can the line be drawn where they say that granting these requests is going to be an undue hardship versus the courts or whomever else is overseeing the case just kind of telling the business tough luck these these are sincerely held religious beliefs and you know that that's a, a right that these employees have to, to practice their religion and um, you know there it's not their responsibility for for the others in their workplace I'm. Uh, I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants to weigh in on anything they've seen in regards to this, but that it's a really tough question, quite honestly. Yeah, I would I would just agree with you. I mean, I think you'd probably want to talk with your legal counsel um, and go through kind of what the effect it has on you. What are your alternatives to not providing those days off? I think, um, like Paul said, it is very tricky. It's a high standard, um, and you really have to kind of go through very specifically that case by case basis of the facts in your particular situation to kind of analyze that. Um, it's not not an easy um, one size fits all answer. Yeah, good, good. Great, uh, great answers. Now, next question here that we're receiving, we're a community healthcare center with 275 employees. We, uh, a cure per, uh, per pay, I think that's a misspelling, um, but I, I believe that they may be right. And our PTO policy starts at 22 days Per year with up to 15 days carryover. Would we be exempt from providing the additional time under sick leave? I, I think on this one, I, I'd have to know more to really kind of figure out whether the paid sick leave applies and their particular situation and what's going on there. It's possible that it applies. I can't really tell from that. And I just want to be clear that, again, that the expansion I was talking about is not an additional amount of sick paid leave to the paid sick leave law. It was an additional reason to be able to take the paid sick leave. Um, but if that person wants to follow up with me um, outside of this venue, and we could go through the particular situation. Um, I'd be happy to do that, but I just don't have enough information to answer that question. Sure. And we encourage you uh, to email us here at the chamber uh, as well. We'll put our, our contact information of course, we can uh, relay this question over to Sarah after the uh, presentation here today. What is a qualified alternative retirement plan? Does match need to be for all employees? Robert. Uh, sure. So if I'm reading that <clears throat> correctly, um, an alternative uh, would be something like a 401k uh, versus the CT uh, Roth IRA uh, program. Um, uh, so <clears throat> with, with the CT savings plan, you do you are required to match the 3%, <clears throat> like I mentioned. Um, you know, if you looked at alternatives like a 401k plan, there are more flexibilities where uh, you can, within your plan document, you don't have to match. Uh, if you do match, there's a waiting period or a vesting schedule. Um, but what you, what you can't do is say, I'm going to match a certain percentage for, let's say, managerial folks and a lower percentage for um, let's say uh, part-time or, or other uh, other classifications of employees. So the match would need to be consistent um, across the board. Perfect. Good news. So a lot of other questions for those who employ part-time employees. Are part-time employees who are paid hourly entitled to the uh, Connecticut Family Leave Benefits, CT Family Leave Benefits? And who would like to jump in with that one? Okay, so um, trying to look up, I want to make sure I get this right. I mean, could be, yes, an employee becomes um, eligible for the paid leave benefits if they've earned wages of at least um, 2,325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the five most recent completed quarters. Um, and they're currently employed with a covered um, Connecticut employer. Um, so that, that definitely could be. Um, possible in this situation. Yeah. That's great. So we, we welcome a few more questions. Just got time for another question or two for many of you who are participating here today. Just fire it away and, uh, um, and we'll be able to answer this uh, for you. So 
just very briefly, I just like to go around the room a little bit very quickly with the three of you. Um, we have a lot of HR specialists. We have a lot of employers who are on today who are registered for this webinar. Um, Robert, I'll start with you. Go to Paul and then Sarah. Um, how would you like people to stay on top of things in this very complex world uh, to not be blindsided? And, and Paul, you mentioned some of the federal activity that's been going on. But Robert, how can people stay on top of all this information? How can they continue to be diligent? Um, I think kind of reiterate <clears throat> what I mentioned before is lean on your your trusted partners, right? Um, lean on your CPA, lean on your payroll uh, professionals, um, lean on your advisors. Uh, you know, those folks are are out there, you know, participating in education uh, seminars and things of that nature. And and you know, as a business owner, you you wear a lot of different hats, and you can't keep up with all this stuff yourself. I mean, so you do need those professionals that are helping you uh, run the administrative uh, part of your business um, to provide you with information like this to make sure you're compliant with certain things and up to date on, uh, you know, HR uh, changes, things of that nature. Right. And Paul, you presented a boatload of information on the federal level and, and even just even on state laws. Um, yeah. You, you have to have something in your inbox and in your in your uh, email and you have to go to websites frequently yeah no yeah it, it's having a good network and you know looking out there and seeing you know who who takes all this complicated stuff and and digests it and, and presents it to you in a way that you can understand and, and that's different for everybody everyone likes it a little bit differently some people want to want to see the law as it's written some people you know eyes glaze over when they see all the legal jargon and want something in in more layman's terms so um really get out there figure out you know who 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 your network is and who you trust um certainly at mp we do you know at least a couple webinars a month so um you know we're, we're sending out that information and, and doing our best to proactively reach out on thought leadership and, and compliance items but yeah it's a matter of finding the resources that help you understand the information and, and getting getting on their mailing lists and getting on their webinars and so on and so forth is really the, the best approach, I'd say. Get it too. And also uh, someone is at, uh, definitely fluent in legalese, Sarah. Uh, it is learned counsel. It is having some type of investment uh, with your company to have really good legal advice uh, because this is what you track. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I rely on my my partners too to keep us all up to date because it, sometimes it's fast and furious the changes that are coming down so um it's not always easy because it, it can be a lot and it can i know it can be overwhelming for employers so i agree with having a good network um that you can rely on to keep you updated is, is a good way to go great well we want to thank you i mean this has been an excellent conversation with the three of you here today um you know i i I personally have learned a lot and I'm not in the HR field. So uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Paul Carellis, the Vice President of HR Client Services, um, MPHR. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Robert McDermott, Senior Partner, Account Manager of Human Interest, and Sarah Healy, too, Partner of Carmody Torrance Sandek, Tennessee LLP. Thank you all for uh, being with us here today. It was a really good uh, conversation we've had on Connecticut federal workplace laws, developments, and implication. Thank you for, for being part of this today. I want to thank you all too. Just a couple of things to wrap up our, our uh, conversation here today. We do have a couple of events with our chamber on September 14th at Hotel Marcel, uh, New Haven, down in Long Wharf. We have our 2023 annual policy summit, building an equitable economy with panelists uh, that day. So come on down from three o'clock, learn about our equitable economy and how we're building that here through the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Our Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce will be hosting a big expo in the North Haven Green on Saturday, September 23rd from 11 to 4. We have over 50 booths. There will be antique cars, there'll be music, there'll be children's activities, there'll be food. You'll learn about North Haven and North Haven business on that day. Of course, looking forward to November 15th, uh, the Big Connect Expo, our premier business expo, business to business right here. Uh, presented by Comcast Business, and that, of course, uh, be coming up. Downtown New Haven booths are available right now. We want to thank you all for attending. Uh, it's been a real wonderful conversation that we've had with all of you. Robert, Sarah, Paul, thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, attending. And for those of you who are looking for the uh, PowerPoint and the slide deck presentation, we are saving this to our YouTube channel. You go to gnhcc.com uh, to learn more or go to our YouTube channel uh, and subscribe with the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. So thank you all for attending. I'm Ray Andrews, an Executive Director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce, affiliate uh, with the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for attending today. Have a great day.